Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi with Spore Hell Why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. We watched a classic television show. Yes, the three-hour pilot, if you will. We've been doing a little bit of a thing called the pilot series. There's been a couple episodes where, maybe because it's a good idea, but also just in the interest of laziness, we've been doing just the pilot episode for a show, which means you get to touch on a lot of the cool world building stuff, but you don't have to spoil the whole show. And also, we don't have to sit and watch the whole show because that's a lot. And here we are this week, pilot series. What what do we watch? Well, you've, you've probably seen it if you listen to us. Probably. It was the Battlestar Galactica miniseries, the reboot that the Sci-Fi Channel did. Yeah, dude, you believe this 2004? That was so long ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago. Lordy, lordy. So uh, what we're doing then, our plan, and we'll warn you if anything goes off track here, but our plan is not to spoil the whole show. It will just, I think, be talking about what's in the the first three hours, the miniseries. So spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the Battlestar Galactic miniseries. What is it about? There's a war with robots. They rose up against their masters 40 years ago. And then everything's pretty happy. Yep. It's like Perfect Strangers, but in space. Perfect Strangers. Okay, wait. I did Bar- Balky Bartokomus. <laughs> <laughs> so wait. It's like it's like Three's Company, but in space. Everybody's having a gay old time. Yes, it's exactly <laughs> like that. Nothing happens. Nothing goes wrong. No killer robots. The end. The end. <laughs> That's all not true. It's actually... They come back and they nuke everyone. They do their damnedest. Yeah. Humanity just happens to get lucky in that they were mothballing the Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica, which was old. Old to deal with the last war. All right. And by way of review, this show's so good. It felt great. I know I know. I really, 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 really enjoyed the show, watching it two, three times all the way through, maybe, since then. But... uh as soon as all these people were on the screen, it felt like it felt real familiar and real comfortable. I love these people. I'm really, I, I was really happy to get back and spend some time with all these characters that I enjoyed so much. What a great show this was. And it should be appreciated for being what it was at the time, because this was really breaking new ground in science fiction drama, 2004. Did you watch Deep Space Nine? Not all of it. People like Deep Space Nine. The way that TNG was a little bit of a like alien race of the week type thing. There tended not to be a lot of continuity between episodes and between seasons. That was not DS9, was my understanding. It was it had arcs and drama. Yeah, yeah. Which that's is what deal. people liked. I, oh, so since you're not familiar, maybe you didn't realize the dude behind DS9 is the dude behind Battlestar. So like the deep drama, political intrigue, large character arcs, and like extended story that goes between seasons and episodes. You can see him like working out the kinks on Deep Space Nine for what science fiction television could support that way, and then getting to fully spread his wings on Battlestar. Ronald D. Moore. And so your summary of what happened was robots go away, then robots come back and nuke everything. And that is the case. But that's like, there's actually a lot of time before they come back and nuke everything. 40 years. No, no, I mean in the show of us watching, where we get to get familiar with a lot of these characters. I appreciate that. A, A lazier show could have skipped the character time quite so much character time in the beginning and just got down to brass tacks. But we get to meet all these people and Edward James almost is the best. We were recently having conversations about off the show. We were talking about actors with presence, actors with presence, like who could be, you know, a real leader, a leader of men, a George Washington, you know, Julius Caesar type. And we didn't think of this, but this would have been a good one is Edward James almost as an example, as a Dama. Bear my hand fights a Cylon. And beats him to death. Beats a super strong robot to death with his bare hands. If he wasn't already earning your respect. He should have stood over and been like, so say we all. <laughs> <laughs> just one liner style? Yeah, just like tripping blood off his fist. <laughs> or maybe like each punch. So, so say we, we all. <laughs> as much as I appreciate Picard, if we're talking Star Trek captains, I would be very partial to Picard. Once a Captain Adama is up for consideration, I think he wins as best captain. What a baller. Well, he's not a captain, though. He's a commander. I thought he was admiral. Admir- he becomes admirable. Yeah. Admirable. <laughs> <laughs> admirable, admiral. What a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he becomes admirable. Oh, yeah. 
he becomes admiral after the rest of the fleet explodes. So I guess he's not in the running for best captain then, is he? But honestly, everybody on the show is just really great. Man, I miss these people. I'm so happy to be here. I'm probably going to continue watching Battlestar now, now that I've begun. They do have a super strong introduction into the series. 33 minutes after this. Oh, the first episode of the show proper. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. This sounds kind of played out now, but apart from the characters, like the world was, this doesn't sound like a good thing to say about something anymore, but it was gritty and realistic. Like before the DC universe came along and like made that sound bad and terrible. Well, sure. I mean, you're comparing it to Star Trek, which typically has the utopian feel to it. Everything is bright and shiny. And the darkness is hidden underneath. In this, there's politics. There's the 12 colonies who don't always get along. There are mothballing ships. You know, people get into fights right off the bat. Everybody's banging and cursing. Yeah, and everything isn't all bright and shiny. It's this is an old and looks it battleship. Especially when you get on in the series and we're talking about like it's been lived in. Very thoroughly lived in over time. So it's to put yourself in the mindset of 2004... Things didn't do this. This was new. It was very special. And it still looks great. Especially when you run into part of the ship got hit with a nuke. It survived. But then they have to come in the split decision of, do we wait to try to get the people out or vent them? And it's no, vent them now. Yeah. Got to put that fire out. World building. It's lived in. The papers are all missing corners. It's the real innovation here. There was a story for this. Because, you know, all the all the paper in the show, or nearly all, and, like, books and stuff, everything is clipped off corners. Where we would normally have a rectangle, it has the corners snapped off, snipped off. And there was a story that has been since corrected by uh, Ronald Moore, the dude behind the show, where it was like, we had a joke. We're like, ha, we're cutting corners in the production as they were putting the show together. And they wound up doing that as a joke, and then it stuck. And eventually they came to be like, oh, God, I wish we hadn't done this because it's like a lot of work to cut all the corners off the stuff, all the props. You can't just get a book. You can't just get a paper pad. You no, have it's to like yeah, the folders it. and yeah. the books. You have to turn everything into world appropriate shape. It's some form of hexagon, yeah. Which is a really horrible pain in the butt. So the story was like, ha, ah, there was that in joke that got out of hand. And it wasn't apparently. It was eventually corrected by Ronald Moore. And the story, he just he said that was a myth. Not true. And the, these people just hate right angles was the quote. Basically, there is no good reason. It was a decision they made to make it seem like alien and weird, and then it just might have been a pain in the butt. But is there a reason to do this? Maybe. Maybe it's worth asking a stupid question. So efficiencies, especially manual labor, pretty important when it's manual. Nowadays, you still want efficiency because why not? And to cut the corners off would be a material waste. Yes. Or it would you'd have to go out of the way to make the process to make this mm-hmm. type of paper. And that's not the primary reason for why paper is shaped the way it is nowadays. What do you mean? It is designed so that it maintains ratios when folded. So it is consistent to itself when folded. All right. So all, all that like A11, A blah, 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 all the different paper sizes that you see like on a printer. Yeah, if you were to fold it vertically in half, you now have two equally sized pieces so it's not like the shape so much, it's the it's the aspect ratio is maintained. Yes. Right. That's a clever thing. That's a fracking clever paper invention. Mm, I see what you did there, Chris. <laughs> did fracking not exist back then? Do you mean the like hydraulic fracturing fracking? Yes. Um I know I'm sure it existed. Because I could still see that as derogatory. A lot of people don't enjoy fracking. Yeah. <laughs> Frack you. Oh dear. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> Don't inject a, high, a bunch of high-pressured water and oil mixture into me. <laughs> to extract my gases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, hydraulic fracturing for sure was a thing, but it was a public issue that people started talking about, I'm pretty sure, after Battlestar, which I found very confusing. There were headlines about fracking that I knew must not be about Battlestar, but sure were confusing. Actually, in the original show, they spelled frack as F-R-A-C-K. And in the new show, they wanted it to be a four-letter word. So they just spelled it F-R-A-K. And fracking with the C is the, the process. Is the fracturing. So, yeah. now, so you can actually, if you're writing it down, at least, you can tell the difference. They use this in the show in the 70s, too. I feel like the frack thing was a really good option. Like, think about what you can do. You make up 
curse words, you bleep them. Yeah, what the frill are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, we, we touched on this with different shows, like, Firefly had Chinese curse words. We've had Nick Farmer of The Expanse, he's the linguist who did the language on the show. They have a lot of really fun, it's kind of the same thing as doing the Chinese, a lot of really fun made up, made up slash non-English curse words on the show. You can get away with a lot that way. In those other cases, with the Chinese or with the or with the belter cursing, which are just made up words, evolved from real languages, but still. This is something we talked about with Nick Farmer, where he is designing the belter language on the expanse. A big part of that was curse words. It's a blue-collar space station. People are going to talk this way. And his job was to make a coherent future, a coherent future Earth language amalgamation and to create and pick curse words not just because they would make sense in terms of an etymological evolution, but to make them make sense for the English-speaking American viewer, right? It's not just evolve curse words out of, like, Finnish. <laughs> you, you can't just, you can't pick a frilly Finnish curse word. No. You have to get something that sounds like our curse words in English. Sure. And they tend to have a certain format. And, well, yes. So you'd want to develop a specific cant or vernacular for the group because- Curse words aren't always the same. They are living things. And you'll find they cross languages and new ones are developed. That certainly happens. Especially in a pigeon language. The idea that I came across recently that I thought was really neat concerning cursing was like in English, a higher than random distribution of our words that we use for cursing have like a single syllable consonant round thing going on. Like, fuck, shit, shit. Yeah, they're satisfying because they have that plosive, like, emphasis. Now, but the question is, do those, maybe the Finns are like, Pukula, and it feels great. I probably, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave all of these bleeped out. It'll be really confusing. But is that a post hoc thing? Is that that we're used to them and that's what a curse word sounds like? Or is that like an inbuilt thing? Because there are languages where they do not have the same, where they don't have, now, these aren't all of our curse words. We have ones that, like, asshole is two syllables. There are certainly exceptions. It's just that a very high percentage of them do fit this form. And other languages do have things that do not match this at all. They'll have their own set of sort of the general sound and feel of curse words that is not matching ours. The idea that I came across that I thought was really neat is the idea that, in language in general, not just for cursing, that words will cluster around function or form. There have been studies done, right? where they will take made-up word A and made-up word B, and they'll apply them as a brand name. An example being, which glass cleaning spray would you prefer to buy? Would you think Brissarex or Glycerex was a better glass cleaner? Totally made-up words, no connection to anything, but I think I'm going to know what your answer is. And if it's to the contrary, it's because you're being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see it on my face? <laughs> uh, the one that sounds like listen. Exactly. Right. That's not because of an inbuilt connection between that sound and meaning in human language necessarily it definitely isn't but there is a gravitational weight to some sounds just kind of because they landed there that type of thing you know what i mean like that we don't have a good explanation the idea is that we don't have a good explanation or a reason for there to be gl words all related to like light and glistening and clean but there are and the idea is that if one thing it can even start with one thing where something lands with this sound combination arbitrarily because that's it is language is arbitrary that those will attract similar words, similar in form or function, whatever it is. And that's how you wind up where curse words will maybe eventually where we'll have curse words with a high prevalence of this sort of shared closed single syllable consonant thing that we do that feels so satisfying to us when we say it. And so frack was a really good curse word. Now let's talk about those fracking robots. Fracking chrome toasters. Which would be derogatory. Much like skin job. Another example of, you know, essentially a curse in the show. It's your form following function. The original machine uprising. You know, if we were talking about, and we did talk about this in 2004 probably, but not on a podcast, we had to have had a very different conversation that we're having now than we're about to have, I guess. Point being, the conversation here, I don't think, is about the machine uprising so much because, like, it's very played out. Our concern, you'll notice our concern now more, 
I mean, in the room, but just in general, is the concern that artificial intelligence will generalize and do something against our interests. Like murdering us. Yeah, but we're not talking about the robots will rise up and kill us. That's no longer the thing we're imagining. It's not Terminator with the killing machine robots. It's the paperclip factory. That sort of thing. It's become less discreetly humanoid. Yes. Is all. Which I think is a good thing. It's still about them or it gaining some level of sapience and deciding I don't like being subservient or you in general I or was... whichever factor leads to it deciding to want a world without humans in it. I wonder if this is some of the academic understanding trickling down into the lay conversation where we're more concerned about that paperclip factory than we are about the killer robot. Maybe it's a recognition that robotics isn't as impressive as it should have been by now. You notice with the paperclip factory thing, one of the options is that it's like, I don't want to be a subservient anymore. So that's fair. It kind of doesn't even need to be awareness to get out of hand and act against our interests. We're noticing. Just in the context of Battlestar, we're taking it very personally. They're like looking at us and they're mad and we look at them and we're having a war. Oh yeah, they're absolutely wrong that they were created and imbued with human emotions. I if mean, you want to guarantee someone to be belligerent, that's the way to go. But that really, that was their problem to begin with. You shouldn't have made embodied artificial intelligence. Which, while they can communicate, I guess, don't have like a central high mind type of thing at all. But what they will notice eventually is that the computers, their opponents, are good at hacking computers. The Battlestar is old. It's designed in an old manner from the Cylon War. And we wind up talking to Guy's Balthar when he is railing against the ban on AI research. And so that's that stage. Like, we had the robots. That rube. We had the robots. They could hack our Gibson. So we stopped having a Gibson to hack. Everything became like simple computers, no networking, just avoiding the vulnerability by not having those things be allowed. The why can't we work on AI type aspect. Let's network everything. This will never be a problem for us in the future. That's just typical human short-sightedness. You have a enemy who wasn't defeated, went away, could come back, that they keep a Space Force for, but aren't designing them specifically with that in mind. Also, it doesn't help that they completely infiltrated their defense systems yeah. and put in a bunch of back doors. It would actually be kind of difficult to cordon off what AI is that you're going to ban. It's a, it's a very vague term. It tends to be sort of synonymous with machine learning now. Although, I think, again, they have a very concrete example of the things that gain sentience and then killed a bunch of us. We don't <laughs> want you doing that again. Okay, so That was bad. <laughs> please, please, please don't do that. Double please. Please do make sentient robots again. Yeah. So what if it's not a ban on AI as much as a ban on sentient robots? That I get. No doubt. No argument here. And then again, you run into the they're going to be so much more capable at infiltrating your systems unless you've massively rewritten your technology. And even then, it is not easy to isolate systems. That's why everything on the old ship, on Galactica, is as analog as possible. They have firewalls and they have computers. It's just that they're separated from each other. And they're, they're kept primitive. Like, these are not machine learning AI things that could possibly get any ideas about taking over. They keep it that way. And you can say, why don't you just have more firewalls? Or why don't you, you know, you, you can make the Battlestar a Faraday cage, for instance. But you still have sensors. And if those are automated, there's going to be ways to hack it that you haven't thought about. That could be the particular way that photons are interpreted. Mm -hmm. Could trigger some kind of... You know, exploit. It's not necessarily about primitive gimped up computers. It's just like that they're small, robust, and not connected to stuff. That basic technique seems to work out pretty well. And it's actually a really good idea. Militaries have been doing this in real life, too. Not completely cutting things off so the robots can't hack them, but the humans. The humans are actually pretty good at hacking stuff, too, at the moment. There have been efforts, and they've been very successful, I guess, of like taking weapons and vehicle systems and modularizing and hardening them and separating them in a way that even if, because there's still like, there's a lot of stuff on like a helicopter, a lot of parts, a lot of systems, they kind of have to be connected. It's pretty important. But 
what if you can separate the flight control microsystem and have that be hardened and separated so that they can't like crash the helicopter or take your pick of whatever part, but the pick the important parts and separate and harden them because to do so is incredibly expensive. Like we're getting better and better at what's the term for it? Mathematically proving code, formally verifying code which is basically what you're looking at, where if you or I make a script to do a thing, we write a program on a computer to, uh, what what could it be? Say hello world. To say hello world. (laughs) Something really complex. Because, unfortunately, it's incredibly difficult to do. So let's stick with a a simple No, you're right. It is a good example. Because you want to program that thing to do hello world, you might do it and then test it and test it in a naive in a naive way to see that it functions under your expected circumstances. You might step it up a notch by designing a test first and programming for that test and keeping that test as part of an integration to see if it works under the conditions that you specify in code. But the next level of actually making a thing proven to function, and that sounds like a weird concept, but while it takes a lot of work, you can mathematically prove that code given the suppositions over here, will produce these sort of answers over here. And when I say mathematical proof, I mean like using formal logic in the manner of a mathematical proof, prove that this happens the way you want. And this is this sort of thing is very, 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 very expensive, but we can do it. It's totally not something you or I writing Hello World are going to think about, but when you are doing like aviation software or whatever controls a battleship, like these things are so important and regulated that part of the regula- the part of the regulatory system is often requiring this sort of treatment. And the reason that you don't do it is it's because it's so difficult and so very expensive to the order of like hundreds or thousands of times more in cost to produce the same to produce the same piece of software with these conditions. But the upside is you have a pretty much guaranteed error free program or set of code. Yes, mathematically perfect given a set of conditions. So even though there's that cost and the complexity, there's a bit of a high demand for that. Because like you said, with the military, if you can do this for your drone, you know, that's, that's huge. You you just remove the huge attack surface. That's the idea. And there's a million, there's a million other like things that could go wrong, but the idea is modularizing and doing this very expensive work to avoid catastrophic failure or exposure. But really, we're talking about this happens for tens of thousands of lines of code at most, and it's going to cost a lot of money. And and we're talking about like embedded systems, thinking a helicopter, but this is kind of practically impossible for a lot of different kinds of things that we do. Practically now, so like there's always the future where we can supercompute it to death and the problem is solved. Although just by scale of resources, the Mm -hmm. amount of rewriting from base of what you would have to do. Practically impossible. And that things are not just tens of thousands, but millions or tens of millions or more of lines of code. Yeah. So take an important piece of software like the Linux kernel. I cannot imagine a future where that is mathematically proven. We have mathematic... uh, What's the word? Again, we have formally verified operating systems and kernels that exist, but they're very small and they do very specific things. And it's not the Linux kernel. Although you can take highly vulnerable or highly attacked subsystems and apply that. Exactly, same thing. And and even if you can't formally verify some software in this way, in the manner of a logical mathematical proof, a lot of the techniques that would inform that work can be used to just improve things without going all the way and without costing a thousand times more to do. And you can imagine, perhaps, when we're talking about like the Battlestar, these are small, isolated, specifically disconnected systems this is the sort of place you would think that would be one of the steps too, part of their part of their requirements. But you you could make sure like the system that controls venting the entire ship to space, for instance. Yeah, you make sure that one has been verified. There are ways that can go wrong, but there won't be a bug given a set of preconditions that will just go haywire. Someone can still walk in there with a screwdriver and mess things up, but the code itself will behave as expected within limits. And so we got Gaius here talking about opening up the AI, AI ban, and... He wasn't even the one pushing for that either. What do you mean? It was the infiltrator. She was doing all the work, Caprica 6. 
I think that's what they're getting at is she was like, hey, you want to do some trade here? And she got access to the defense ministry's systems, wrote code for him, and he got to be all Mr. Smitty Pants Man. Who wouldn't do whatever the hell she wants? I find myself, how do I put this? Very impressed with sex (laughs) on the show. I love how when they're hanging out, Gaius and Six walking around and she keeps like doing the Jesus thing. Yeah, that kind of throws you for a loop. Yeah. And she's like, but you need to love me. That's such a God serious. is love. That's such a buzz. Don't you feel dude. God? Is this my bias or is that the most incredible part? Is that these, you would think, rational machines. Why would, they gotta be rational? Would come, good question, would come up with the God thing. Because like people, humans did it because we didn't have a better answer. Kind of what I'm thinking is the the whole the whole God thing has been whittled away over time, but it's still there. And the reason it was there is because we didn't have a better answer. The things we have left are just like are holding on just because they were there a long time ago. If we were in, insur- but the Cylons come into the world of science in the present, where well, not the present, they're born into a world of science where that's not necessary. Zoltan Ishvan, who was on the show a couple times, wrote an article related to this. Um, the question he was asking was, should we, will we, what will happen when we have a generalized artificial intelligence? Will humanity share religion with it? Because to be fair, I imagine a lot of the higher end of academia, scientific researchers that are doing the work on AI might not be as religious as the general population. Most of the world is. So if world governments and the larger population of the world has an interest in the turning on of the artificial general intelligence that we'll probably eventually get. Will they tell it about Jesus? Will it be convinced? Or would it be built into his programming? Well, how do you provide unbiased information? Do you just give access to all the information? Because any information that you carry and give to it will be biased. Yeah. I was thinking, um, was it the, the LA crime? That, no, what was it? it was with Elliot... I believe it was Oakland. And it was talking about the police, how the automated system was biased racially because of the data sets that it was being fed in. Because the data set that was given, the data sets that they were given were produced from like systemically racist practices, <laughs> oddly enough. Yeah, yeah, that'll happen. So something funky has gone on with the creation of these humanoid robots. And then they have sound in space. Sometimes, but not all the time. And it's pretty good. And then they run away. And then there's a whole series. The end. What do we learn? I wound up learning a bunch about their religion because I read wikis. Oh, no, that's not allowed here. No, it's not. That is not within the scope of this episode. Are you happy with your venture? I don't know. It was a thing. It it solved an answer. (laughs) I don't know. It solved the question. It answered a question. (laughs) It did something. Yeah, it did something. What did I learn? I learned about exactly the sort of scale of difficulty and cost of formal verification of code. The concept was not foreign to me entirely, but I really didn't get implementation at all or like how much could we actually do. And I'm not very impressed. It's pretty good, but it could be better. It's early days. And also, I guess the my recent revelation, uh, my my recent appreciation for the idea of linguistic coincidental clustering. I don't know if there's a term for it, but that's what I'll call it for now. The way you get a couple of words fitting the form and similar things tend to settle in around it. Also, Battlestar is awesome, man. It's felt real good. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It it reminded me, uh, watching this, of Free Space 2. Specifically, they made, or there was a mod for Battlestar for it. Hold on. That was made. Recommended related stuff. Colbert, what might we recommend? That thing that I just said, (laughs) Free Space 2. How it reminded me of that. Because that was one of the first space games I really remember with like truly large capital ships duking it out. And then they made Battlestar Galactica a mod for it. Or a mod for Battlestar Galactica was made for it. Okay. So I was vaguely recalling the name of Free Space, but it is it's an open sourced space combat sim. Actually, here's the thing that I can connect with. It comes from Descent. It's a sequel to Descent which is something I'm familiar with. And it makes a lot of sense because that was the first really good three-dimensional combat shooty thing that I recall. So 
Free Space 2 was a game. It went open source. All kinds of people made all kinds of, all kinds of things with it. The game for Battlestar is called Diaspora. Also, should recommend, I don't know if everyone else liked this, but I really enjoyed Caprica. So we have Battlestar Galacta was awesome. Uh, but there was also the prequel series that got canceled way early. And it was very clearly a surprise when it got canceled because the last episode was probably one or two seasons worth of material. They just like shoved it real hard in there. Very awkwardly. And you feel bad. At least there's a conclusion. So there's that. And it was the it was the origin of the Cylon AI stuff. Send your robots and all that. And so maybe check those things out. They're in the show notes. And then also maybe consider supporting your creators online. Colbert. Yo. Support your creators online. <laughs> so say we all. So say we all. I think it's a good idea. And I'd like to thank the people who are supporting this show. They're Joe Ferraro, Terrence Lee, Jeremy the Top Poster, Alan Michael Pools, Chrome Toaster Superman. Hey, wait, that was a thing. Wasn't that steel? So at one point, Superman died. And then a bunch of Superman stand-ins started like fighting for the title of who's going to be Superman. It's like there's a person who grants you Superman status. You could just do it if you want. I'm not sure what they were fighting about. but Because six, like four or six of them came out of the woodwork. Yeah. But one of them was steel. One of them was a movie with Shaquille O'Neal. Also, Robert the Roaster, Sci-Fi Interfaces Enthusiast Hugh Fisher, Lucas the Blazing Firework, Dean at LSG Media, NDP at Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Andrew Capitula the Mighty, Jeff Farmer Schwartman, Synthetic Nipples Chris Kennard, Michael the Giants Peterson, Sammy Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh Evangy of LSG Media, Mr. Reagan Curly Phil, Tema Sigma His Arms Wide, John Jwares, Sweet Sweet Cylon Milk Matt Greek, yeah, Gina Lomolino, Adrian Mihaela, Dinosaur Hunter, who is an excellent person, and thank you. Also, Arcobi FF Joe Ruppel, Adam Piper, Jesse Privet of the Countdown to Geektown podcast, Danny Maliori, Buggy Deer Luke Bailey, Washing Himself in the Co-Ed Shower as Eli Avron, Alark Dirk and Gunnarm Superhero, Daniel J. Sparker of Uncertainty Principle of the podcast, Andrew Falcone of this podcast sometimes, John, Champion of Skin Job Beavers, it's like those cats with no hair. The thing is, just like, don't search for naked beaver or hairless beaver. And um, so, but yeah, I guess, I guess it's basically a naked mole rat, except like bigger with a flatter tail. Here, as an exercise for the listener, you go search for naked hairless beavers and tell me what you find. And DJ Sexy Red Dress Moffat and my mom and Grandma Judy and Magical Flying Secret Robot Unicorn Julian Creighton. You think it's just a normal unicorn. We call them robots. We shouldn't call them robots, should we? Cyborg? Android? Android? Cyborg? I guess it depends on the internals that we don't see. Pretty they, sure. They seem to be almost fully biological. Right. So the chrome toasters are robots, but I'm not actually... I think we should uh, be careful. Probably Android. Thank you, everyone. Those people are all great. So be like them. Support your creators online. And if we're the thing you want to support, you can go to cyphersci-fi.com to support the show to support the show. You can also help support us by spreading the word about us. Send people to decipherscifi.com slash subscribe. By hook or by crook. And that's it. Battlestar so good. So say we all. Chris, you're a bold and talented individual <laughs> with strong podcasting skills.